I believe we uh, have some early joiners. Uh, welcome to uh, today's session on really meet the professors is what we're calling it and how we've uh, built it. It's your chance to learn about the new master's degree program that the McCain Institute has on offer. We're going to get started pretty much right on time here in another minute, minute and a half. So please uh, settle in, get yourself uh, uh, comfortable. You'll get a, an overview of, uh, of the master's degree program, then a chance to, uh, to meet the, the, the extraordinary talent we have uh, delivering one of our main classes in it. We are going to be monitoring the uh, uh, chat feature on uh, YouTube. So uh, some of you have already sent in questions. Uh, uh, if you come up with a question as you're watching, please fire it in. Or if you got a question on your mind right now, please go ahead and send it in and, and we'll get to just as many of your questions as we can when we get to that sec section of it. Okay, again, I know we have some people uh, just joining us. We're going to make a start right at three o'clock. I'm Luke Kinetic, the uh, Senior Director of Communications for the McCain Institute. In just a minute, we'll get started uh, with an overview of, uh, of the master's degree program, then your chance to, to hear directly from the professors uh, delivering uh, some of the key uh, courses in it. Okay, my uh, iPhone, which we'll come back to in a little bit, says uh, three o'clock, so we're going to make our start. We're really thrilled so many people could join us for this virtual uh, event this afternoon. I'm Luke Kinetic, the head of communications for the McCain Institute, and you're here to hear about our new master's degree program, and specifically the course called Modern Global Economy Dollars and Cents, as you see on the screen, and to meet uh, the professors, the amazing professors uh, behind that, uh, that'll be delivering that starting this fall. But first, I want to turn it over uh, to Ambassador Ed O'Donnell, who heads up our master's degree program and more to do with our leadership programs at Arizona State University. Be very brief with his uh, bio, but uh, an ambassador that served all over the world, uh, a really interesting duty in places like uh, Germany, uh, Panama, uh, and, and stays uh, so connected to that. So Ed, over to you to talk about uh, what you've put together here with this master's degree program and, and the unique offering that it is. Okay, thank you very much, Luke. And thanks to everyone who have dialed in for this afternoon and a pleasure to, to hear your questions later. I think we have an you have an opportunity to meet two of the professors in this master's de degree program who will take a deep dive into the course they're going to be leading. But first, let me just say that this master's degree is really a joint venture between Arizona State University, one of the premier public institutions in the United States, and the McCain Institute headquartered here in Washington, D.C. And I think that that joint effort by both institutions brings a very unique aspect to this master's degree program. So the master's degree in international affairs and leadership that we are offering will prepare you for a career in international affairs, and it will help you to become a character-driven leader of your generation. We will focus on developing your skills and preparing you to serve a greater cause. And that's in the model of global and U.S. leaders, certainly like Senator John McCain and others. Our courses focus on future issues in the global arena. These are trends and opportunities, challenges or problems you're going to face in your generation, such as environmental sustainability, innovation, national security, pandemics like the one we're experiencing today. We know that's the that's going to come back in the future, sadly. We use case studies in our courses that will stress hands-on diplomacy and practical applications of problem solving. We have evening classes in the center of Washington, DC, in this building that's on the screen right now, the Barrett O'Connor Center of Arizona State University. That location is very convenient for working professionals in the Washington, DC area. And our classes are led by top foreign policy 
and national security experts with vast experience developing pol policies and also leading programs. So in a few minutes, you're going to meet Undersecretary Kathy Novelli, Ambassador Bill Height, former U.S. Ambassador to Cambodia, who will be talking about the, the course they are offering. Also from the McCain Institute, one of our senior directors, Nick Rasmussen, who will be offering a course on counterterrorism. He is a senior director at the McCain Institute with vast experience in the U.S. government on counterterrorism and national security. Kristen Abrams will teach a course. Uh, she is the Senior Director for Combating Human Trafficking at the McCain Institute, runs a very dynamic program. And Mrs. Cindy McCain is very directly involved in that program. That's one of the important pillars of the McCain Institute and the programs. Also another important program in the McCain Institute is Human Rights and Democracy, led by Paul Fagan, who will also be teaching a course. And finally, in the, this example of some of the professors leading our courses, retired Admiral Margaret Kibben, who will be teaching a course next spring on religion and, and foreign policy. So here are the four courses that we are starting with, with the first contingent cohort in August of this year. Two core courses. One is Principles of Character-Driven Leadership, led by retired Lieutenant General Benjamin Freakley. Now this is unique among master's programs. We have a strong component of leadership, character-driven leadership. This is one of the unique features of our program. General Freakley, U.S. Army retired, led troops in Afghanistan, distinguished military career. Also, making of U.S. national security policy, another core requirement. These two courses lay the foundation for the master's degree. Two electives that are being offered in the fall are U.S. Diplomacy in Action, the Embassy Country Team. That's my course I'm leading based on my Foreign Service experience, what it's like to work in an embassy overseas. But even if you don't want to be a Foreign Service officer, it will help you with understanding working in a foreign country. We're going to focus on Germany this fall. So what it's like to be in the U.S. Country Team in Berlin, Germany, in all its aspects, the bilateral relationship, uh, economic, political, public affairs, and so on. And then finally, the modern global economy, dollars and cents, which you'll hear about in just a, mo a moment. In the, in the spring of 2021, here are the courses we're offering. Again, international leadership, more case studies, hands-on, led by General Freakley. And he brings in outside speakers like former four-star generals and, and, and also admirals and, and also not, uh, civilian leaders such as ambassadors and others who have led in the private sector as a part of understanding their leadership journey, what it takes to be a character-driven leader. I'll teach a course on international negotiations, both in the public sector and the private sector. Nick Rasmussen, I mentioned in his course on setting the global counterterrorism agenda. You'll see Nick Rasmussen on CNN. He's often quoted as an expert whenever there's a tragedy of a, a terrorist attack. And so he, will, he knows firsthand and he's still very much involved in that world. And then finally, religion and foreign affairs taught by Admiral Margaret Kibben, who was the senior chaplain of the Navy and Marine Corps as a rear admiral. And she's got a very interesting perspective of the interaction of religion with foreign affairs. So what about the tuition? And I've told you about the value. I've told you about the networking and the people you will be getting to know as your faculty, as your mentors, as helping you with your your hopes and, and your, uh, your, your core aspect of what you want to become in, in your, your career. But for the tuition, we think we have a very reasonable uh, 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 and significantly less tuition than other master's programs here. The tuition costs are significantly less. For 36 hours of a, a full program over the two years or more that, it, that you would be in the master's program, around $58,000, which is significantly less than Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, George Washington University. So how do you apply? Go on the McCain Institute website or Arizona State University. I would encourage you to not wait to go ahead. We're accepting uh, master's candidates on a rolling basis and the slots are filling up fast. 
The deadline is actually June 30th, but again, I would not wait. Go ahead, reach out to us, ask any questions you have either today or later, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. And now thank you very much for your attention and I'll turn it over to Undersecretary Kathy Novelli and Ambassador William Hyde. And just before we do that, I think we owe them just a little bit of an introduction. I know some of the listeners and watchers out there, if you're like me, you've looked up their bio and I won't belabor it, but I do think we need to uh, highlight a, a few things. And you know that lineup, the value proposition, I think what I hope really comes through is this is based on practitioners and people who have who have done it. And, and if you look at, uh, at Kathy Novelli, Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy and Environment for three years, reported right to the Secretary of State. And that's a huge job. It touches economic growth, environment, science and technology. You talk about someone who's opened entire markets for the United States and, and put together economic engaged initiatives that, that span the, the globe very involved with uh, uh, the ocean. In fact, is an ocean elder and still involved with that, renewable energy and think about what that cuts across. And prior to that, the State Department, oh, by the way, uh, helped gain access for the iPhone to be able to come to, to China. So brings that uh, experience from the private sector that's, that's uh, almost unprecedented uh, and teamed up with, uh, with Bill Hyde, who as you heard uh, Ed say, was former ambassador to, to Cambodia for uh, more than three years and has been teamed up with Kathy Novelli on a lot of the initiatives and other things that I talked about, wildlife tracking, trafficking, ocean conservation, economic policy, uh, di diplomacy, uh, you know, there's some of the top things that you can uh, uh, take on uh, in, in the world and now that's what they've diffused into a class that they're going to talk to you about. I love the title, uh, they can start wherever they want, but modern global economy, dollars and cents. And we know that right now, given what we face, knowing how the dollars and how to make sense of things is more important than ever, particularly if you're a practitioner or an aspiring practitioner out there. So uh, with that, I'll throw it over, I believe, to, to Kathy, you're going to lead off. Oh, great. Thanks for unmuting me. <laughs> um, and thanks. Thanks, Luke. And uh, thanks, Ed. I am absolutely thrilled to be able to be here and to talk with you, answer your questions, and tell you a little bit about our course. I'm thrilled to be working with Ambassador Haidt again. Um, we, were, we were a wonderful team at the State Department. We've continued that as we uh, post Post uh, being at the State Department, I've gone on to teach at Georgetown um, in their master's program. I, and I'm on several boards of directors, including for environmental organizations. And I'm leading a nonprofit that is doing listening sessions around the United States uh, on trade and globalization. Um, and uh, I have been extremely fortunate in my career to work with amazing people and to have had experiences that um, where I was in the right place at the right time, like negotiating all the free trade agreements that we have uh, still existing uh, in the Middle East, um, to uh, helping when the Soviet Union broke up and negotiating all of the agreements that we have in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union on trade and investment. Uh, to then or working for Steve Jobs and then Tim Cook at Apple, doing all of the public policy globally for that for that company, um, and having a multinational team around the world helping me do that. So um, I am really looking forward to bringing that experience into this classroom and um, and to working with Bill again. And Bill, um, I will let you talk about your amazing. No, thank you very much, Kathy. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm also delighted to be teaming up with you again on this, this super interesting course we're going to deliver. I was very inspired working with Undersecretary Novelli at the State Department when I was there, and uh, we did some great work together, and so I'm, I'm glad to be putting the band back together, Kathy. Uh, so um, international economics is
It's been my career for 30 years. I've been an economic officer in the State Department. Since I got back from Cambodia as ambassador, I've been teaching at the National Defense University. I've been teaching economics, um, uh, business analytics, which is a course that kind of spans economics in the business world. And next year, I'll be also teaching an elective on Southeast Asia. So, so I, I've, I'm making that transition to teaching full time. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. The thing that I've really, as I look back on my career, the thing that I found most interesting is, is analyzing sort of the process by which developing countries or emerging markets, they succeed in the global economy. Not all of them do, but some of them do. And, and it's super interesting to go look at, at, at what the, the things that countries have done, right? This policy steps they've taken, the, uh, the, 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 the relationships they've built with other countries and other companies and how they've succeeded. That. And that's what we, one of the things we hope to bring to our students in this course. I saw this firsthand in Poland and in Indonesia and in Cambodia. And uh, I think it's just really a super interesting way to look at the global economy. There's no single recipe for success for sure, but uh, it's, it's certainly an area where, where uh, and an approach to economics that I find is really very fruitful. So thank you. All right, with that, I believe we're gonna kind of go to kind of a question and answer and back and forth here. You see, uh, you see on the, 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 the screen here uh, a little more about the course and then also uh, some of the facilities uh, in play here, the decision theater and some of the high tech uh, uh, facilities that's at the, the Baird O'Connor Center downtown, a part of Arizona State University, which is number one in innovation uh, out of all public, public uh, universities. Um, I know we have some questions coming in, but I'll ask, uh, I'll ask one of my own, and maybe this is, you know, hearkening back uh, to, 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 to my master's degree uh, program. And master's degree programs are meant to be rigorous, and I know this is meant to be rigorous as well, but I, I remember when I was doing mine, I had a little bit of trepidation. I hadn't done a lot of math or economics or, or things like that in a while, and I just wanted to know what, uh, you know, what was in store for me. So could y'all speak to that? Do you really need to be absolutely on top of your game? Uh, for economics and, and, and math or, or, or how, 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 how are you presenting that? Sure, and, and Luke, we, we're going to a little bit, give a little bit of a sense of the class too. Um, so in terms of economics, we're gonna talk about economics in an applied way, in a practical way. I certainly um, don't have a degree in economics um, and um, our class is really gonna be a very, as you can see from the slide, an experiential, hands-on learning, looking at seminal issues in the modern economy, as Ed said, things like supply chain, things like um, how does the environment impact uh, your, uh, your choices, either in policy or business, looking at things like the digital economy. Um, so it's not necessary to have a, an economics background uh, per se, and we plan to have a lot of guest speakers, we plan to have a mock negotiation, a lot of role play, and really get you to learn by doing. So that's the, um, that's the sort of gestalt uh, of our course. Um, and um, Bill, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything further about that. Uh, no, thank you, Kathy. I think as you can see on the slide, uh, one thing we hope to do is to bring in, or that we will do, is that we want to bring in some of the amazing talent in Washington, D.C., who have experience in some of the issues we'll cover in the course to talk directly to our students. For instance, we're going to, we hope to bring in a trade expert from the think tank community to talk about trade policy, even though I'll be honest with you, no one in Washington knows anything more, any more about that than you do, Kathy. Uh, we're going to we're going to bring in a delegate to the IMF and World Bank meetings. The annual meeting takes place in Washington in October, so we're going to bring in a delegate to one of those meetings, either from the U.S. government or from a, a, a visiting country. Uh, we're going to bring in a venture capitalist or an investment banker to talk about the really very important role of private capital in in the in the world economy, especially for developing countries. Uh, Kathy and I both have a passion for innovation, and we and I think one of the Kathy's course at at Georgetown right now is really very pathbreaking in the way it's it's integrating innovation issues into into uh, e international economics, and so we're going to bring in an economic policy uh, e innovation policy expert uh, 
and and I hope to find a, a good uh, energy ec energy policy expert to bring in as well as well as a speaker from the climate community. Those we have a lot of good ones in D.C. And finally, I think the one key thing we're going to do is to is to bring in some business leaders to talk about about leadership and how the private sector responds to some of the character. Uh, some of the ish challenges they face when making their business decisions, as well as the role, as the decisions the private sector has made with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have a unit towards the end of the course, which I think it'll be in November, where we're going to talk about the COVID-19 thing, an international health system. Obviously, it's having an enormous impact on the global economy, and so that's something we're going to integrate into the course. Thank you. Yeah, and just if, if um if we could go to the, the next slide, we wanted to just give you a taste of where you're gonna end up um, at the end of this course, just by uh, explaining uh, what we mean by hands-on um, policy development. So in our final project for the course, you are gonna be the economy minister of a developing country that you'll choose from a list and you're going to have access to a $5 billion loan, low interest, that you're gonna to have to decide how to spend to best effect for your people and your country's development. And you are gonna get all the tools that you need to be able to do this in a compelling way um, throughout the, the whole course. Um, so um, we are going to, uh, to talk about all these issues that we have um, that we have been addressing, and Bill, do you want to talk a little bit about those? Sure. So you have your five billion dollars, and you could, you know, that's a significant amount of money for almost any country. Only the United States burns through that like, like, like nothing. Uh, but in any event, so what? What would you do with your five billion if you have this low interest loan? You could. You could invest in your trade infrastructure, in your logistical infrastructure, your ports and roads, so that you could take a more forceful and successful role on trade and investment. You could, and of course, a number of Asian countries, Southeast Asia, Korea, have done that. You could also use that money to build out a stronger financial sector so that your financial institutions would be able to bring in all the people in your country would have access to credit, access to capital, and you could sort of do a development from within strategy. Uh, one thing countries are doing these days, increasingly, is they're putting their money into the digital economy because there's a lot of uh, emerging re uh, research on how, how a strong digital strategy increases growth. And so you could, you, could, you could use your $5 billion to build out a national broadband system so that everybody in the country could have access, say, to online education or to market tools for business, to employment market tools for getting jobs. You could do that. Uh, one thing that brings developing countries down a lot is energy, right? Energy, if you're dependent fully on the global markets, that can be a tough world. So one thing you could do is you could use your, your loan to improve your energy security, possibly by going into renewable energy in a big way. And very honestly, for a number of developing countries with uh, relatively low, low levels of energy demand, that's a, significant, that's a very possible strategy with the, at the state that technology is today. And you could also go safer as we, if you could try to use that money to improve your innovation system, your technical high schools, your universities. Uh, you, you, could, you could mainline some science, technology, engineering, and mathematics programs from a very young age so that you would in, improve the uh, innovative capacity of your economy as well. That would be a legitimate strategy. And finally, you could look at resilience. Developing countries have a difficult time with natural disasters, with all sorts of other challenges, you could use your, your, your loan to improve the resilience of your country, especially with respect to climate change and other environmental threats. So we're gonna cover each of these issues in the course. We're gonna look at good readings in them. We're gonna to talk to experts. We're gonna give you the tools you need so that you, when you devise your strategy for the country you pick, you'll be able to pick one of these or perhaps a combination of them. And I think that combination is gonna be really key because you know, an economy and a thriving one isn't just built on one thing. And so this is gonna help you also weigh how do you look at what's your comparative advantage for your country? Um, how do you look at how to stimulate all of these things and how do they become a virtuous circle? 
So, um, so it's really multi-dimensional chess that you'll be playing. And, um, and that's how we're going to look at these issues as, as we look at them. Um, one of the other things that we're going to do as we, as we are hands-on is looking at leadership skills and looking at, um, at this character-driven leadership that the McCain Institute is so strong on and look at what's worked for current leaders and how do we apply these leadership skills in our classroom in making these kind of decisions because these aren't easy decisions to make. Um, and looking at that, not just as uh, people who are at the level of ministers, but for yourself too and for your career. Um, because I think one of the things Bill and I have talked about a lot is the importance of leadership and getting those muscles working on leadership from a very uh, early age. Um, and that is really what's going to carry you through, especially when you have to confront very hard issues. Bill, did you want to add anything? No, that's, that's exactly right, Kathy. And, and, um, uh, you know, you, I, I know you'll remember that when we were at the State Department and you were the undersecretary, there were 700 people working for you. And, and so sometimes you wouldn't, you wouldn't see people very often, but there were some smart young people who felt passionately about an issue and who, 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 who were superb analysts and had creative ideas for solving world problems that would help the United States and would help help other countries and they would push those ideas forward and they were ex they were exercising character based leadership at very young uh, very uh, young stages of their career and i'll be honest in my own career my my first big break came when i had only been in the state department uh, se seven years which is you know still pretty junior and when we did our economic opening to vietnam and that that was the issue and that time they needed somebody to dig through all of the laws and all of the programs and all of the legal restrictions and figure out a strategy for opening up our economy you know opening our economic relationship with vietnam and that's something i not because i was the expert and honestly i think at that time i didn't know anything more about these issues than this you know I, I was at a pretty early stage but i dug in in that same passionate way and i and I, and, I, and I did that work. I was that smart young guy back then. And so um, it, it really moved my career forward. And we, I hope we can help give our students those kind of tools so they can be successful like that as well. Yes, and I think also I would say I had a similar kind of thing at a very young stage of my career when the first day of my job at the office of the US Trade Representative after working for a few years in, in other places was uh, as the director for the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. And the first day of my job was the day of the coup against Gorbachev. Um, and so the Soviet Union started to break up and subdivide. And I was dispatched with a team to negotiate all of these agreements with all these new countries. Um, and I was a not very old at that time, very junior. And I had to absolutely um, lead this team uh, leave the negotiations and really just kind of grow up in a very fast way. Um, and as you say, I think, you know, if you exercise those muscles early and often, it's a really, it's a really good, really good thing. And I think from that, I didn't do that by myself. I had incredible mentors and we would really like to be mentors to you as well. That's something that both of us take very seriously. And um, I continue to mentor my students that I've had at Georgetown. Um, and I, I hope that we'll be able to continue to mentor you as you go on through your master's program and your career. But I would like to just say, um, uh, you know, I think that's, that's those kinds of, of opportunities that when, when Kathy mentioned how the, 
Soviet Union fell apart. And those, those of course, those happen, those continue to happen in the world economy. And we're gonna have opportunities in our class to sort of develop those skills you need to take up advantage. We're gonna have simulations, uh, a negotiation, or rather simulated negotiation about privacy regimes. We're gonna have some group projects that are gonna have, have require presentation and also uh, project management skills. And so we're gonna help our students develop those skills that need to take advantage of those opportunities like both you and I had, Kathy. So thank you again. So we're going to uh, move to questions and answers and and, and more uh, discussion here. I mean that was uh, that was uh, that was great, but uh, I, I can't resist. I I just glanced at my email and I won't say the full name, but Savannah wrote and said, uh, "Thank you for hosting what seems like a great master's degree program and shedding the light on this opportunity. I'm eager to apply." And I think that's a neat note. I'm glad to get it. And Savannah, please apply. But the class size is meant to be pretty small. I think around 20. Uh, correct me where I'm wrong. And you're getting pretty close. So, you know, sure there is still, there are still some open slots. But I would say, you know, get in there. The application deadline uh, is coming soon. Um, I'll get to a question. But that five billion dollars um, and, and and talking about kind of playing multi-dimensional chess. I'm struck by how some people, you know, maybe like fantasy football or fantasy sports leagues. Um, that's not me. For me, if you're kind of a policy uh, person or a practitioner, that kind of opportunity to think about how you would spend uh, five billion dollars or think how you'd work through uh, leadership problems and challenges um, from real, you know, practitioners' uh, uh, perspective is 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 pretty uh, pretty amazing. Um, but I, I, I guess I'll kind of go uh, uh, one more. I mean, what what are you going to be looking at in terms of uh, folks' uh, written products or kind of how they uh, uh, produce their uh, and sharpen their their, their skills? Um, how 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 do you anticipate that kind of weekly assignments or or go into a little bit more detail on that? And then we had one other uh, question about the diplomacy and action course, wanting to understand a little bit more how it's uh, structured and how it sets up. So kind of those two questions and then I have another one after that. Okay, well, so for our class, um, we are gonna center the written work around these, um, these different uh, simulation um, things that we're gonna do. So um, there will be both oral components and papers for various of these topics. We're gonna have some um, sort of hands-on experiences Besides the one I outlined as the final project, which is an individual project, that, that for example, would have a, a relatively substantial paper plus oral presentation. Um, but we're going to have, for example, a project on privacy where people will um, be role playing for various parts of the, the uh, privacy policy debate, the legislature, the industry, the NGO community and will um, present to their viewpoints both in writing and orally and then have a negotiation where they try to work together to come to a solution. So, so we are going to have a written, um, written things that will require some research, um, oral uh, presentations, uh, but those are going to be centered around sort of practical projects in, in each one of those uh, areas that we outline. Uh, if I could, I'd give one other example. One of our early assignments, and we have, I think, a total of four assignments in the course. One of the early ones is, is a business location decision um, project where, where your, your company that has to make a, must make a decision on where to locate a new manufacturing facility. And uh, you have to look at a range of factors that we're going to give you, things that we'll be discussing in class, and then make a write a brief paper and present on where you would recommend the company locate its new, its new facility. You have to look at things like branding and, and of course at labor and at, 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 at tr uh, ease of trade, uh, trade, um, trade facilitation issues and all sorts of things that come into a business location decision. And we've got some great materials to read for that, including some, a couple of great case studies and things on how big companies have made those decisions before. And so we'll peel that stuff apart and see where you guys all want to locate your new factory. Okay, I'll, I'll feed in a few more uh, questions uh, here. Um, 
is the idea that you do this in two years, if you want to do it in an accelerated fashion, can you do it in a year and a half, or if you want to take longer, is one question. And then the second uh, question is, uh, is this uh, course and master's degree likely to make me a more competitive candidate to be a foreign service officer? Well, let, let me answer the one about the timing. Uh, we, we're offering four courses in the fall, four courses in the spring. We also are offering a summer 2021 courses, both online and, and, uh, and so it's probably gonna take 36 hours, uh, is gonna be two years. Uh, you can try to accelerate that through maybe online courses that could be transferred over online ASU courses. And we would accept, I, I think, uh, up to nine credit hours that way. So, but I, I, we still would hope that even at a full-time basis that it, it, we hope that that two years is probably a, gives you time to sort of absorb everything for us to help you develop as a leader. And also in terms of the, the basic information knowledge of the economy, global economy that you'd be getting from the, the global economy course that you just heard about. So uh, it could be done a little bit faster, but, and, and also uh, I mentioned courses that we're offering in the fall and spring. We also will be offering electives uh, on Asia and China. Uh, and these are two of the uh, professors here, experts, uh, Ambassador Haidt and Undersecretary Novelli, for example, as a future course, uh, a course on Western Hemisphere, a course on Europe. On, on, so we will have other electives, but I'd say, think in terms of two years, either full-time or if we're thinking working professional, certainly on a part-time basis would need those two years for sure. Um, and then I think there was one on diplomacy and action, the, the course I'm teaching, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that. And that that's a hands-on practical exercise of what it's like to work in a country team. I'm the virtual reality ambassador and each student has a role in the country team. So every day based on real events of what's happening in Germany, I'll be role playing and asking the student, what would you do if you're the political officer in Germany about what just happened in the news that maybe there's criticism of US policy towards Iran? How do you handle that? How do you work with your German counterpart if you're a political officer and you're going to the foreign ministry? How do you explain US interest and, and still have a good relationship with the Germans, one of our closest allies? So it's hands-on in that sense of diplomacy and, and but also like Undersecretary Novelli was saying and uh, Ambassador Haidt, we're, we're training skills. So how to write a one-page briefing memo, concise, pithy and to the point, or give a, a elevator speech to your boss or five minute presentation to a group. Those are skills that are needed for your leadership future as being a future leader. And then I think I thought, forgot one of the other questions. Well, no, Ed, thanks for picking me up on the diplomacy in action. I was gonna circle back to that and that, I'm glad you gave a more on that. Well, the, the question was, will this help me be more competitive to be a foreign service officer? That's the one that still remains. So maybe, maybe I could address that briefly. I have a couple points I'd make. Of course, I am a foreign service officer. So to this day, for more than 30 years. So uh, I would say a couple of things. First of all, of course, it always helps to have a master's degree. Uh, they give you more money when you join, to be honest with you, if you have a master's degree. And having that, that post-undergrad work and the sort of contacts and things you learn, I think is very helpful. I think more importantly is that the, our, the course, the way Kathy and I are structuring it is specifically targeting those kinds of skills we think you need to succeed in the foreign affairs community. And of course, foreign service is a big chunk of that. Um, and you know, some of these skills about group projects and negotiations and analyzing and learning, learning to an advanced sort of a, a journeyman level many different aspects of the international economy, all that stuff is super, super useful for a foreign service career. And then finally, I'd say that that negotiation project that Kathy described, the one about the privacy regime, that's very similar to the negotiated, to the negotiation um, uh, that you do as part of the foreign service entrance exam. There's a group negotiation as part of that exam. The way Kathy described that, it's very similar. So going through that once would be, I think, 
would it would be a, a great little bit of practice for you. Thank you. Okay, waiting for a few more questions to uh, to, to pour in, and as they do, um, how, how are you going to make it fun? You know, I, I guess I should say it like that, but I remember going to get my master's degree and you know, you've worked a full day and then you want to learn and, and that sort of thing, but you, you want it to be engaging and you know, it's not entertainment to be sure, but, uh, but uh, can, can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I think that learning should be fun and especially at this level. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we're really concentrating on these very hands-on projects because you're learning by doing. Um, and of course, there's some background that you have to do on your own time in terms of reading, but, but our idea is not that you are sitting there just as the repository of us talking to you or guest lectures talking to you, but that you are actually engaging and you're producing results yourself. And I think uh, most people have found that type of experience in other classes that I've taught to be very fun. Um, and in fact, in, um, in negotiations, for example, I've had lots of comments from students at the end saying, wow, that was really fun. Um, and I think if you're not having fun, then maybe you're not in the right, uh, in the right field. And, and I would add in terms of fun that um, the McCain Institute has a lot of events in our other sectors. Uh, that the master's candidates would be invited to and welcome to, to join in, which are receptions, meeting senior figures in Washington who give speeches like the Afghan ambassador that came into the McCain Institute last year. And those are significant substantive events, but they're also fun getting to know the diplomatic community. In my course on diplomacy in action, we'll go to the German embassy, meet with senior German diplomats. And so, there's a fun aspect to going out and taking advantage of Washington, the Washington experience, which I, I think combines learning plus having fun and enjoying meeting new people. And I think if I could just add, I think there's something else that's really important and that is to be preparing yourself to do work that's rewarding. And, and not just financially rewarding, that's always nice, but personally rewarding, where you feel that you are contributing something to the betterment of, of the country, of the world, to society. And that's the kind of thinking that we want um, our students to do. And we wanna show you the possibilities there. Um, and um, that's the thing that keeps you engaged for your whole career. Ed, I, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot for this, but but the class, uh, the, the the cohort, or whatever you're choosing to call it for the fall is is forming nicely. Can you kind of give us a sense of uh, the, the range of, of you know, people and, and diversity and, 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 and skill sets and the like of the incoming class so far? Sure, be happy to. We, our target is 20 students, but we, we do have a little range plus or minus in terms of space and availability. We want to keep it small in the first cohort so we can give really hands-on attention for each of the students and their goals. So we can tailor their program toward what they want to do with their career. And so the diversity of the students we've already accepted into the program is geographic. We've got actually four uh, non-U.S. citizen uh, students coming from different countries. We've got some from Arizona who are graduates of Arizona State University, some from Texas and, and Tennessee and other universities around the United States. So uh, it's, it's an interesting mix of, in backgrounds. Not all of them have studied uh, foreign affairs or in their undergraduate career. Some One in our members making a career shift wants to do something else and, and now in foreign affairs. So it's, and we will, we will nurture that group dynamic so that they learn from each other. That's why we want to do it as a cohort. And I think that's been very valuable in other programs we've done at the McCain Institute that, that the students, the MA students learn from each other. And, and this can be for, for you or for, for all, because I'm not sure if you've all worked with him or not, but you know, the McCain Institute has a new executive director. I guess he's still new. He's been with us more than a month uh, now, but I think that still constitutes a new, and that's 
uh, Ambassador uh, Mark uh, Green, who in, until recently was running uh, USAID. So uh, how do you envision him uh, being a part and accessible to this master's degree program? And then, and then Bill or Kathleen, you know, I think, you know, you, anything you care to comment on, on what his uh, presence and connection to the program might make? Well, I, I'll start. I'm, I mean, he is the executive director of the major institution besides Arizona State University. So Mark Green has a very distinguished career as ambassador, director of Agency for International Development up until just a, a month ago. Uh, he's very much a global individual with a lot of experience, head of the International Republican Institute, a very deep career in global affairs, and the students will have opportunities to hear him speak and and uh, get to know him. He'll be involved in all the programs of the McCain Institute and certainly very much aware of everything we're doing in the master's program. If I could say a word or two on that. So Ambassador Green, he has had a terrific career and he was ambassador to Tanzania. And then of course, the head of USAID until just recently. And you know, I would love to hear what he has to say about some of the issues we're going to raise in the class. For instance, strategies for countries to succeed in the global economy. He's seen that firsthand. That's one of the big one of the big priorities at USAID of USAID's assistance. They have a big economic growth program. They've tried to help many countries make that transition to a successful, developed country. And so, I would love to hear what Ambassador Green has and has to say about some of these issues, and I bet he would have some very insightful things to say. We're coming up on the uh, the 45 minute uh, mark. I, I think uh, we, we left aside as much as an hour, but the idea was to do this in 30 uh, to, to 45 uh, minutes. So I think I'll just give each of you the opportunity to, to add anything you'd like to I'd like to add, and then before I do that, really encourage folks to go in and 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 and, and sign up. You know, you see uh, you see where to go to, to learn the information, and you can always write master's degree at McCainInstitute.org. We monitor that email address very uh, very closely uh, with with your questions. But anything you'd like to add as we uh, close up here? I just like to say we're really excited um, about teaching this course. We've had a great, a lot of fun designing it. And um, we can't wait to engage with you. Uh, I, and I will just say, if you have questions, I know uh, sometimes the logistics are as, as challenging as anything. If you have questions about moving to Washington, finding a job, where you're going to live, we're happy to answer those questions, be as supportive as possible if you live somewhere outside of the Washington DC area. Uh, and it, it is a, a, a challenge, it's sometimes intimidating. I've, I've now taught students over five years who've come from Arizona to, to Washington. And, but it's an, it's an incredible experience uh, to be here, especially this year in a presidential election and with this, the sad pandemic that's going on, how U.S. policy is being formed, being here on site is just uh, value uh, that will pay rewards later in your career, having been a part of that dynamic, the, the hothouse sort of political environment of Washington, D.C., and a part of this master's program. And again, Senator, you heard Undersecretary Novelli say, I'm here to mentor and help you with your future career. And I know Ambassador Height and myself and others take that very seriously, that it's not just about you being in a class, it's about us getting to know each other and us helping you in the future with your goals and aspirations. Thank you. Well, Ed, I think we'll leave it, leave it there. You know, sign up, check it out. Um, Going to start in August, whether that's in person, uh, virtually, or some combination, uh, all will be clear uh, as things uh, develop given the, the pandemic. But, but, the, but either way, an unbelievable opportunity to be part of the inaugural uh, cohort in this master's degree program. Uh, we will, do hope that you'll reach out and that we appreciate your participation today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.